Okay, Paul Salmon here. This will be part 19 of passing your uh, check ride into Robinson R44. Next thing we're going to discuss is aeromedical factors. Just rapidly go through, the, ask you the question, here's the answer. Aeromedical factors are going to ask you the symptoms, cause, effect, and corrective actions for each of these uh, uh, disease states or situations, I guess you could say. First of which is hypoxia. So what causes hypoxia? And the answer is you're too high in altitude. Uh, how do you fix hypoxia? And the answer is descend. Descend to a lower altitude. If you think you're becoming hypoxic, you want to descend to a lower altitude. Also, if you have oxygen available to you, you can put oxygen on it as well. That would also be a, uh, one way to treat hypoxia. Next is hyperventilation. What causes hyperventilation? Something frightened you. You scared the hell out of yourself and now you're breathing too fast. How do you fix it? Well, what the FAA wants to hear you say is sing out loud, or sing rather, or talk out loud. That forces you to slow down your respirations, and you can't, at least in theory, hyperventilate while singing or talking out loud. Right? Next would be uh, middle ear and uh, sinus problems. And the answer they're looking for there is that, you know, if you had significant middle ear problems with eustachian tube dysfunction or sinus infections, that you basically would not go flying, and you need to uh, see your doctor and have that treated before you go fly. Uh, next of which, uh, next question would be spatial disorientation. If you thought you were becoming spatially disoriented, how would you fix that? And the answer is trust your instruments, all right? Trust your instruments. Right. Motion sickness. If you thought one of your passengers was becoming motion sick, how would you treat that situation? And the answer is tell the passenger to look all the way out the front window. Don't look at the side of the side glass. Look out the front window and return and get them back on the ground as soon as you can. And while returning back to the airport or wherever you're going to drop the, the uh, passenger off at, you want to make nice gentle turns, no significant banks, uh, no significant uh, 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 banks or rapid turns, that sort of thing. Right. Next would be carbon monoxide poisoning. All right, so if you thought you had a problem with carbon monoxide poisoning, they usually have a situation where your carbon monoxide detector light lights up. How would you uh, attend to that situation? Well, the answer is you turn off the heat. That's a usual source of carbon dioxide poisoning and you would open all of the vents and you would land as soon as practical. Right? Next stress and fatigue and dehydration those are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, they may ask you what's the most common sign or most common symptom with uh, dehydration the first symptom is going to be thirst. Right? So stress, fatigue, dehydration, you know keep yourself well hydrated, get plenty of rest, that sort of thing. Next thing, scuba diving. You're going scuba diving, uh, or you have been scuba diving, and it was a non-decompressive dive. How long do you have to wait before you go flying? And the answer is 12 hours. Right? If it was a decompressive dive, where you had to decompress on the way back up, now how many hours do you have to wait before you can fly the air, fly an aircraft? And the answer is 24 hours. If it was a non-decompressive dive, and you're going up in an aircraft that is not pressurized, and you're gonna go above 8,000 feet, then that also would be a 24-hour wait period before you could fly. Next question, alcohol. What uh, percent uh, blood alcohol is, is uh, do you have to be less than to be able to operate an aircraft? And it's less than 0 .04. So less than, not 0 .04, less than 0 .04%. <clears throat> All right, next question, how many hours bottle the throttle? And from the time you took your last drink of alcohol, how many hours do you have to wait at a minimum to be able to fly the aircraft? And the answer is eight hours bottle the throttle. Eight hours bottle the throttle. Okay, next we're going to cover just some random items. So let's say you're coming into a helipad and it looks like this. And you've got a number on the helipad that, that, <clears throat> that one has the number 12 there. Or maybe a smaller helipad, like one of the Robinson private helipads there that has the number three on it right there in the center. So what does that number mean? All right. And the answer is it's the weight rating for that helipad in thousands of pounds. So this one on top of the U.S. Bank building in L.A. is rated for 12,000 pounds. And the Robinson uh, much smaller helipad is rated for 3,000 pounds. Okay, next. What is the one, two, three rule for settling with power? One is 10 knots forward airspeed or less. Number two is 20% power to the rotor or more. And three is 300 foot per minute descent rate <clears throat> or greater. Lacking any of those three things, you should not be able to get into settling with power. Okay, so looking at a sectional map, what does the 8-3, right here, this 8-3, what, <clears throat> what does the name of that and what does it tell you? And it's called the maximum elevation figure 
and it's the highest object within that sector rounded to the nearest 100 feet. So if you're at that altitude, 8,300 or higher, you shouldn't hit anything within that sector on the sectional. So. Okay, on the Cape Copters channel, I've added several playlists on uh, videos that I've done over <clears throat> different concepts that have to do with rotorcraft and um, specifically helicopters in this case. And you might look at the playlist on there. There's some additional ones that you definitely would want to look at. Um, I did a series of uh, lectures on our videos on dissymmetry of lift. There's a total of seven of them, and they I go into explaining dissymmetry of lift to the nth degree. I also did a series of videos, I think there's nine of those, on auto rotations. If you want to truly, really, certainly, truly understand all the aerodynamics of auto rotation, you might watch those nine videos. Uh, there's a series of about four videos that are on helicopter performance charts that would be uh, very nice to be well versed in there and then also about uh, four additional charts on weight and balance and I think that uh, I'm sorry four additional videos on weight and balance the fourth video uh, looks at a very unfortunate accident that happened out in Santa Ana California where uh, weight and balance was actually the cause of uh, uh, an accident that unfortunately had three fatalities involved in it so so if you're in the mood for being an overachiever, you might want to look at uh, those videos and and uh, <clears throat> see if you can really understand uh, the concepts that make a helicopter fly. All right. So I hope this video series helped you. There's a total of 19 videos. Uh, if you guys could add some comments on some of the things that I forgot or that I missed or went over, should have included more of or whatever, just add some comments. Perhaps I'll make a, a 20th video to cover any deficiencies that... Uh, that we miss in this series. So good luck on your check ride. Uh, again, you can use the same information on your commercial check ride or your private check ride. Essentially, you're tested over the same concepts, just a little more in depth on the commercial than on the private. And uh, good luck to you guys. So uh, it'll all be worth it in the long run. Seems like a lot of work that you're putting in to do this. It's more than worth it. And these are things that you really need to understand to be a very efficient helicopter pilot. So good luck on your exams.